Hey everybody. So today I'm going to talk to you about this incredible paper that came out of Stanford. And I joke that we just built the 8-bit version of the matrix because it's this tiny little virtual world they say was inspired by the Sims. But what researchers have done is they've put 25 virtual agents and they call them generative agents, meaning that they can come up with realistic behavior. And there's a basis of this architecturally where chat GPT ends up powering a lot of questions that are needed to sort of power this artificial intelligence. It's like, what thing seems most important or what are some things, what are some ideas you have about doing this thing? And they can think about these things using GPT as a brain of sorts. And then the researchers have grafted on memory into these so that there's a short-term and long-term memory these agents have. And the short-term memory degrades or dissolves, it distills into general impressions over time, but then the general memory of things that are big may persist much longer. And what's interesting then is these little simulated agents, these 25 generative AIs or generative agents then go about their business basically. And if we scroll down here, we can look at a tiny bit at this graphic that basically shows the model. They spent thousands of dollars, they say, on GPT calls, even though GPT-35 Turbo was the model used. That's really unbelievable. Certainly in my experience, it's been incredibly inexpensive. I remember right after the API was released, I spent a bunch of time working on a text-to-speech to text interface for GPT-35. And after days and feeding it what seemed like so many thousands of tokens, I went to OpenAI and checked my accumulated billing. It was five cents. So... You can actually do an unbelievably large amount of inference in that process. I find it fascinating because it means they must be making an extraordinary amount of API calls to do that thinking. If we go a little lower, you can see they've got this whole idea of a memory stream and they can have all these in pieces of information about what are they doing? What have they seen? Things like what are their activities, etc. But of course, as they go around this virtual world, they converse with one another. And as they do almost mimetically, they hand information off to one another, just like people do in this. And so they don't have an internet that they use, I think, but, but they do have conversations and the researchers demonstrated this sort of propagation of information and how it would change the intent of the agents by having two key facts that were introduced to two characters subconsciousnesses, if you will, almost as godlike dictation. And one was one character was going to have a Valentine's Day party. And so she actually then has to go and plan it and execute on it and tell people about it and go shopping for it and all those things, which she does, aided by that GPT powered thinking. And then the other one was somebody decided he was going to run for the town mayor. And so if you get to the end of the run, that these characters now, they have memory of who is running for mayor. If you were to ask them at the start, only the person who's just decided to run for mayor knows. But if you ask two days later, the vast majority of the town actually understands that there's a party. It's going to be at Isabella's house. They understand this other character is going to be running for mayor. The implications this has for simulated worlds seems really profound to me. The reality is people have to actually script all those behaviors. They have to script all that dialogue. I think what we can expect is more optimization, more complication. But I really also think that there is going to be probably a lot of effort over the next five to 10 years to incorporate this into games so that no experience is ever the same twice, where all of the characters respond and adapt and actually write some of their own dialogue or a lot of their own dialogue. Maybe they have much more immersive and extensive dialogue trees and there might be some pre canned things that are oriented around game events that have to occur. Although it also occurs to me that we could be on our way to the sandbox game where nothing really happens. So there's no plot and there's no conclusion. You're just interacting with a virtual world and a whole bunch of, as they call them here, generative agents that are living their own lives. To conclude, I'm going to show you the web interface. And this actually runs a sort of recorded version of the game that you can replay and you can see time is ticking along. I think this is early on the first day and most of the characters are asleep, right? So I can click one and it'll come down here and say, okay, Carlos Gomez, he is sleeping. He is in the villa, which I think is the city in his apartment, in his main room, in his bed. But if we see somebody who's up and about JM here is a bit of an early riser. We can see that Jane Moreno is waking up and completing her morning routine. She is currently getting dressed. 
She's in the closet. Presumably she's selecting clothes. This guy's an even earlier riser and he's drinking coffee, it looks like, based on the icon. John Lynn waking up, completing his morning routine, eating breakfast. The Lynn's family house in the kitchen in the cooking area. So this is fascinating. And you can play and pause these things, but you can see this character is actually moving along through his room. And things go rather slow, this motion is slow, although it's also consuming a ridiculous amount of horsepower in the rendering engine for Chrome. I've never seen anything beat up Chrome as badly as this app does. That's something to do with the gameplay. Really amazing though, I can click on these state details for John Lynn and you can see it brings this up and we've got all kinds of interesting things here. Daily requirements, he's got stuff that he does. He has all these like short-term memories that he knows. And then I think that these are largely weighted in some way, in a way where they can sift down. Okay, so these are, this is an activity log. And then he's got this memory log. Maylin is conversing about Maylin and John are discussing a variety of topics, including keeping up to date on pharmacy knowledge, promoting local artists and businesses, ways to support their troubled and elderly neighbors, improving communication of their relationship and their friend Eddie's music composition project. So we have a couple and they're logging in their sort of virtual memory here information about the conversations that they had in their relationship. Super cool. There's an enormous amount of memory here. And this is obviously too much to feed back into chat GPT all in one enormous thing. You also can come down into this and there's all these details here that they're digested versions of the things that they learn. It's pretty interesting too. The paper talks a little bit about this sort of memory digestion and I haven't read the full details of it, but the idea is that over time, many memories will fade into things that are axiomatic, right? There might be specific evidence like, oh, that person is rude. And maybe they start off with several instances of it, but later on they may digest that into that person is rude. And maybe the only evidence is that memory that they've found them to be rude in the past and they can't cite any specific examples. I think it's definitely worth checking out the paper. I also think that there are pretty broad implications for this. Gaming is the thing that comes to mind first for me, certainly being a longtime aficionado. So super cool. Check it out. Pretty amazing. I think that there are tons of implications. Also, definitely do follow me or subscribe so that I can continue to bring you cool tidbits like this on a regular basis. Thanks.